The name West Nile probably makes you think of somewhere in northeastern Africa. And indeed, West Nile virus was discovered in the West Nile region of Uganda. But in 1999, West Nile arrived in New York and since then has marched west, so that it's now well established in our country. It probably infects hundreds of thousands in the U.S. alone, and although 80% of cases are asymptomatic, it kills 100 to 200 people every year by causing neuroinvasive disease. West Nile virus is an arbovirus in the flavivirus genus, and the flavivirus genus actually contains a number of viruses that cause encephalitis, but we're just going to focus on West Nile for now. And arbovirus means it's arthropod-born. Mosquitoes carry it, and humans get it from mosquito bites. In fact, the usual life cycle of West Nile virus does not involve humans. Normally, it spreads between mosquitoes and the birds that they bite. And many birds, especially outside the U.S., are great reservoir hosts because they develop really high levels of the virus so that when another mosquito comes along and bites an infected bird, it can easily pick up the virus. But in humans, the viral levels never get very high, so mosquitoes can't get reinfected from us. So we are what we call dead-end hosts. And horses, it turns out, are also dead-end hosts. How does infection work? Well, the mosquito bites, viral particles get into the skin and infect skin cells. Eventually, they infect immune cells that travel to lymph nodes and the blood. And in 20% of cases, this causes flu-like symptoms and a rash. We refer to this as West Nile fever. But then in only 1 out of 200 cases, the virus gets to the central nervous system, and we don't know exactly how. So in those cases, what distinguishes West Nile virus clinically from other causes of encephalitis? Well, first, it typically presents with any combination of three clinical syndromes, encephalitis and meningitis, which you're familiar with by now, as well as acute flaccid paralysis, which happens when motor neurons in the anterior horn of the spinal cord get infected. So it can cause all three of these, and all of them obviously involve the nervous system, and that's why we say West Nile virus causes neuroinvasive disease instead of just saying it causes encephalitis. The second thing about West Nile is that overall it's less severe than HSV or rabies. Only about 10% of people with West Nile neuroinvasive disease die, even though we don't have any good treatment. The third thing is that whereas HSV and rabies can basically affect anyone, West Nile tends to cause the most severe disease in people over 50 and people who are immunocompromised. Diagnosis of West Nile virus involves checking the serum and CSF for West Nile virus antibodies. Remember, for most viruses, we prefer to check PCR, but because West Nile has such low levels of viremia, PCR is not a sensitive test. Whereas almost all people presenting with neurologic signs and symptoms of West Nile virus have IgM in the CSF at the time of presentation. Prevention of West Nile basically involves preventing mosquito bites, so it includes mosquito control, protecting ourselves from mosquito bites with DEET, uh, protective clothing, and being indoors.